It's time for the reading of the Word of God. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'd like to preach to you this morning on the peril of perverting the gospel. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege that we have to stand here and, and represent Christ to this congregation and preach the Word of God. And I pray this morning, Lord, for divine enabling. I ask you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I pray, Father, that you would bless this congregation and you would help us Lord, form our ideas of the truth through your word. I pray this morning, Lord, that you'd help us to follow the truth and to obey the truth and to do what you bid us in the word of God. I pray that you'd bless us, Father, if there's someone here without Christ. This day would be the day that give their heart and life to Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. My text is taken from a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Galatian Christians to warn them against deception. Really, this is what this book is about. And there were some in the church that were teaching a perverted gospel. And the Galatian Christians were being adversely affected by this new teaching. And so Paul writes to them with a sense of alarm. He says in verse 7, There's some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And anybody who teaches false doctrine troubles the body of Christ. And by writing this letter, Paul hopes to rescue this body of Christians from apostasy and to preserve the truth among these Galatians. I want us to note three things from my text. First of all, I want us to note the source of the gospel. Where did the gospel that Paul preached come from? Secondly, I want us to notice the seriousness of tampering with the gospel. Why is it so serious to change it? And thirdly, I want us to notice the marks of an authentic gospel from this passage of Scripture. First of all, we notice in this passage the source of the gospel. The people in Galatia had received the gospel as a result of the preaching of the Apostle Paul, the same man that's writing this letter. And by some, and probably by the false teachers in Galatia, Paul did not qualify to be an apostle, and his message was considered flawed. But Paul contends for his apostleship in verse 1. Paul, 
an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And it contends also for the authenticity of the gospel that he preached in verses 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. That is, it is not of human origin. It is not the result of human ingenuity. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. I didn't get this gospel from my parents. It wasn't taught to me by Gamaliel, the great rabbi who instructed Paul in the Jewish religion. Nor did I get it from the apostles of the Lord at Jerusalem. But by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul declares that the gospel he preached was revealed directly to him by Jesus Christ. It was a gospel of divine origin and divine revelation. It came from the mind of God. God transmitted it directly to the Apostle Paul, and he communicated that gospel unaltered to the Galatian people. It saved them. It saved them from their heathen darkness. It saved them from their sins. It transformed their lives. The gospel that came from the mind of God, transmitted directly to the Apostle Paul, and communicated to the Galatian people without alteration. Now, because this gospel is of divine origin, it is not subject to human engineering. To alter the gospel is to pervert it. The essential elements of the gospel do not change to fit the times. The times must change to comply with the gospel. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon religion, by altering the gospel, perverted it. But Joseph Smith doesn't have a monopoly on a perverted gospel. From Catholicism to Pentecostalism and all in between include in their ranks those who pervert the gospel. Some by deliberate effort pervert the gospel. Others by careless treatment of the scriptures pervert the gospel. And many pervert the gospel to distinguish themselves and their group in order to attract disciples for themselves instead of for Christ. According to my text, There are definite, defined boundaries to gospel truth. Boundaries that we must learn from Holy Scripture. Boundaries that we must not change, that we must not alter. The gospel that we preach must be the same gospel Paul preached, or somebody somewhere tampered with divine revelation and produced a perverted gospel. Secondly, I want to deal with the seriousness of tampering with the gospel. Paul, in my text, is clearly alarmed and he's distressed over the teaching that's being promoted as gospel in Galatia. In verse 6, he called it another gospel that is a different gospel a gospel actually in opposition to the gospel that Paul had been preaching then in verse 7 he declares which is not another in other words the teaching being promoted 
in Galatia does not deserve to be called a gospel. There's only one gospel. There cannot be two gospels. Only one gospel. If Paul's gospel is true, the other is false. Both of them cannot be true. To Paul, you know, is the kind of man that is hated by the postmodern crowd that controls our schools, especially our institutions of higher learning, the people, the crowd that controls our mainstream media, our mainline churches, and the Democrat political party. Boy, y'all didn't know I'd get political this morning, did you? Now, it's not confined to the political party, the Democratic political party, but it dominates in that party. And, you know, the feeling is, how dare anyone be so dogmatic about religious truth? To the postmodern mind, truth is a relative thing. There is no absolute truth. So what is true for me may not be true for you. And what is true for you may not be true for me. So therefore, any objective standard of truth like the Bible is rejected out of hand. And when there is no standard of truth, y'all hearing me, aren't you? When there is no standard of truth, there is no means by which to detect lies. When there is no standard of truth, there is no means by which to detect error and falsehood and deceit. When you've rejected any standard of truth, anything goes, brother. That's the mindset of our culture. Our society is ripe for moral, religious, and cultural revolution. And such a revolution is occurring as I speak this morning. The promotion of the homosexual agenda by politicians, by the media, by the professional sports world by the low-life entertainers in Hollywood and in music is proof of positive and willful rejection of divine truth. Brother, there is no other explanation. This is proof positive of willful rejection of divine truth. Paul is not only alarmed at the perversion of the gospel being taught in Galatia. But he's distressed over the change of direction in the church. And he says in verse 6, listen to this, I marvel, I wonder at this, that ye are so soon removed. This happens so quickly. You are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I marvel. I wonder. I'm amazed. Him that called you, 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 you departed from. You, you, uh, you remove, you're removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ. And Him that called you is re- referring to God Himself. So they are being removed from God by this new gospel. The word removed is in a tense, and this is important, it's in a tense indicating not something completed, but something ongoing. So their apostasy is not complete. Later on, Paul will say, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? So there, there's a process going on here. It isn't completed yet, but Paul is alarmed by it. They're in the process of, of removing, going over, 
transforming, transferring themselves. The process of deserting God, deserting the Christian faith. And the underlying Greek word here, according to W.E. Vine, is used in Greek literature to indicate changing an opinion or desertion from an army. So this is the this is the awful effect of the perverted gospel on the Galatians. Souls are at stake. Authentic Christianity is in danger of dying out in this region of Galatia. And Paul is worried that his labor there would be lost. And he says in Galatians 4 and 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Understand this. He's writing to a region of the country. Not to one local church. Not to one local body like this. He's writing to a group of churches in this region. And they've all been affected by it. To the point that Paul is concerned that authentic Christianity is dying out in this region. And he's trying to rescue it by writing this letter. Brother, I'm telling you. I am... Amazed, I never cease to be amazed at the highly contagious nature of wrong thinking and wrong living in the church world. It is highly contagious. Here is a whole region affected by this false gospel. This whole region is in danger of, of giving up authentic Christianity because of this wrong teaching. When a major Pentecostal denomination held a conference, relaxed their standard of righteousness and holiness, preachers and their wives had their rings with them. By the time the vote was over, they had their rings on their fingers. And practically the whole denomination was soon governed by the spirit of the world. Preachers' wives laid out in bathing suits at the pool at the camp meeting. And some people would not go to the camp meeting and expose their boys to the seduction of the preacher's wives laying out in bathing suits at the camp meeting, diamonds adorned fingers and ears, stylish hair, dyed hair, short skirts, split skirts, low necks, pants, suits, red lips, painted eyes, spread quickly throughout the whole denomination. And there was very few that could resist the powerful tide of worldliness. The theme of love made it forbidden to forbid. Almost anything was allowed. Television spewed a steady stream of wickedness into the homes. Netflix augmented the moral pollution of the homes. The theater once off limits for all Pentecostals became standard fare for those who loved violence and lewdness. They all still here. Divorce and remarriage permeated the pew and the pulpit. Mothers abandoned their children for a paycheck. In other words, the church became just like the world. There was a tsunami of pride 
and rebellion and spiritual blindness that engulf the whole denomination. Now listen, I want y'all, I got y'all's attention, Donna. The rule change was not the root of the problem. It was but a symptom of spiritual rottenness working in the church. If the people had been governed by the Word and governed by the Spirit of God, the change in the rules would have made no difference in their living. But the prophets with another gospel had done their work well in advance of the rule change. And the change in behavior was just a symptom of the rottenness already working within the church. Now I know that you know that what I have just described Describes every major Pentecostal denomination we know of. It happened overnight. This is the reason why it's so dangerous to tamper with the gospel. There are always forces seeking to pollute and corrupt the church of Jesus. The gospel, the pure gospel, is what stops the tide of worldliness and defeat in the house of God and brings victory to the people of God. Souls are at stake. Paul issues a stern condemnation of those who pervert the gospel. Verse 8, he says, listen to this, but though we are an angel from heaven, are y'all hearing me? Though Bill Prescott, though the Apostle Paul, though an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which Paul preached, he said, let him be accursed. Did you know angels have led men into spiritual destruction? Why why is the Mormon church alive today? Because an angel told Joseph Smith where to find these plates and helped him, you know, to, to translate these plates of the Book of Mormon. Why do you have the Muslim religion? Because an angel spoke to Muhammad and gave him the Koran. I'm telling you, brother, that if an angel comes and tells us something different from what God has given to us in the Word of God, let him be accursed. That's how serious the gospel is. That's how serious it is to tamper with the Word of God. Paul said, if it is me, if I come to you, with another gospel than what I have preached unto you, me, myself, let me be accursed, he says. That means eternally condemned. Now, it was so serious that he didn't just stop there. He repeated it again. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed, assigned to eternal destruction. <clears throat> Paul's sternness stems from his love for the souls of men and for the honor of God. The gospel truth is that important, brother. Are y'all, are y'all listening to me? I said the gospel truth is that important. It is so important that the messenger best perish himself than lead others to destruction. 
let that man, let that angel be accursed if he tries to tamper with what God has given through divine revelation. Do you get the idea from the apostle here that an accurate understanding of the gospel is not optional for us? And especially for the ministers of the gospel. Willful neglect of God's word leads to confusion about salvation and ultimately to the destruction of souls. Thirdly, this scripture shows us the marks of an authentic gospel. And the theme of the gospel is outlined briefly by Paul in my text. In verse 7 he calls it the gospel of Christ. That's significant. It's the gospel of Christ. It comes from Him. It centers in Him. Referring to Jesus in Colossians 1.28, Paul remarks, Whom we preach. This is the subject of my preaching. Whom we preach. Remarking on His ministry to the Corinthians, He says in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He remarks to these Galatians in chapter 3 and verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He's been preached so plainly among you, it's as if He's been plastered on a billboard. In my text, Paul gives a synopsis of what he preached to the Galatians in verse 4, referring to Jesus who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So, I want to show you right quickly two marks of an authentic gospel as presented here. One is that salvation is due to God's grace manifested in the sacrifice of His Son. Notice verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father And from our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to you. Now, he always begins his letters like this, but it seems like that this is significant, especially here at Galatia, because these people were uh, swerving from grace to law. And so he says, grace be unto you. And notice in verse 6, compare verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, the unmerited favor of God through Jesus Christ. The gospel called you into the grace of Christ. So, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith. In that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is granted to undeserving sinners because Jesus died for them. And no sinner can, by good works, Make God his debtor. Pardon is granted to sinners only as a free gift based on the loving sacrifice of the Son of God on the cross. Christ gave himself for our sins. That was a theme of the gospel. 
Julia Johnson wrote a poem and put it to music called Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Verse 1 says, Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Verse 3, Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is a flowing crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. And the chorus is familiar to us, grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Julia Johnson referred to God's grace as marvelous grace. John Newton called it amazing grace. And Halder Lillinus declared the wonderful, matchless grace of Jesus. This, my brother, is an essential element of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are saved by the grace of God. Secondly, salvation results in deliverance from this present evil world. Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. So there's a transformation that takes place in salvation. We are no longer controlled nor governed by the people of the world. We don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We mortify, put to death by an act of faith, the desires, the drives, the ambitions that made the world attractive to us. We are no longer conformed to the world. We are no longer squeezed into the mold of the world. We honor our parents. We respect our elders. We value divine revelation in the Bible and divine fellowship in prayer. We respect the laws of the land. We give honor to whom honor is due. We pay our taxes. We avoid bars and nightclubs and tattoo parlors. We love the assembly of the saints. We conform to the image of Christ We refuse the fellowship of low-life entertainers like Justin Bieber and Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley and Madonna. We don't open our homes to Hollywood low-life influences. We study the lives of Bible characters and not movie stars and sports gods. Our homes become sacred space, and Jesus is the Lord of our homes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, listen to me now. We have perverted the gospel if we violate these two principles. Any gospel that makes salvation the result of human effort, of doing good deeds, of keeping the law, is not the gospel Paul preached. Good behavior does not secure salvation. If so, Christ died in vain. And man has reason to glory in his salvation. But Paul says concerning the gospel that he preached in verse 5, he deflects all the glory to God to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. When we're saved by the grace of God, undeserved pardon, all the glory goes to God. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We couldn't pay for it. God gave it to us as a free gift, and God deserves the glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Any gospel, on the other hand, that depicts a faith that 
functions without fruit is a perverted gospel. Faith without works is dead. He that is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Whom the Son sets free, hallelujah, whom the Son sets free, they are free indeed. And he just got through saying, He that committeth sin is the servant of sin. But whom the Son sets free, they are free indeed. Hallelujah. Praise God. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God knows them that are His, and everyone that belongs to Him walks away from wickedness. A life lived in the will of God is the fruit of faith. A good life does not secure salvation, but it is evidence of salvation. There is no such thing as saving faith without fruit. And the gospel that Paul preached is a gospel that says Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. It is the will of God and our Father and he deserves the glory. I'm going to wind up here but I went to the zoo at Ashboro yesterday. Took some of my grandchildren. First time I'd been there in years and years and years. Don't plan to go back. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Bad advertisement for them. But I'd like to... Well, I'm telling you, I can tell my age walking all in miles across there. But... Uh, <clears throat> When we, we were on our way there, and we, we were behind Brandon and Kara. They were a little ahead of us, a few minutes ahead of us. And we were almost to the zoo, and all of a sudden I noticed a house on fire. Flames just coming out the front of it on my right. And I was, I'd slowed down and looked, and there was Kara sitting in the front yard in her car. And boy, I whipped over and, and got out and come back and... She and Brandon were the first ones to get there, or to see it. Smoke billowing out of the house. And they called for help. And, and uh, so when I got there, flames were just pouring out the front of that house. Smoke boiling out all the way around it. And uh, two vehicles sitting in the yard. And nobody in sight. And we didn't know. It looked like. Somebody was in that house dying. And uh, there was no way to get in. I mean, the house was locked, but if it hadn't been locked, it was too far gone. And besides, we didn't have the equipment nor the proper knowledge to enter a burning house to rescue people. It was a helpless feeling, brother. It took a while for the fire department to get there with their equipment. They had on their equipment and they could go in there. They busted the door down and they walked in there. And thankfully, nobody was at home. It was such a helpless feeling thinking there may be somebody in that house dying and we don't know what to do and don't have the equipment to do it. But brother, every person in this world without Jesus is in a dying house, a burning house. Dying, eternally dying 
It is an urgent situation. We must not be without the equipment. We must not be without the knowledge to save them. God help us that we be full of the Holy Ghost. Full of a desire to see souls saved. And equipped with the knowledge that we need to rescue souls from the burning hell. From destruction. God give us a desire to know the truth. And live the truth. And be an instrument in the hands of God to rescue souls from the fires of hell. And that's exactly, brother, where they're going if somebody don't rescue them. That's the importance of knowing the truth, brothers. Being saved is coming to the knowledge of the truth. And this is why we must know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the privilege that we've had to be together this morning. Lord, I feel this on my heart. I know this is so critical and important in our day that we have a good grasp of the gospel message. Lord, we need your Spirit to help us refine our understanding, burden our heart for souls. Help us, Lord, not to just hold knowledge in our head, in our heart, but help us to go out into a world that's lost and share the truth of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This gospel that talks about the grace of God, God's riches at Christ's expense. This gospel that talks about a transforming power that makes lives brand new, brings us into conformity to the will and word of God. Father, I pray that you'd bless this congregation. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us in this Martinsville Church of Truth to love the truth, the truth that makes us free. God, I pray that we'd be committed, committed to the gospel of Jesus, committed to living out the gospel in our life, committed to being examples of what Jesus came to make us. And we'll give you the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.